June 21st, 2020, Father's Day. Karen Boyer wrote a poem, and I want to share it with you this morning. It's simply titled, Dad. He never looks for praise. He's never one to boast. He just goes on quietly working for those he loves the most. His dreams are seldom spoken. His wants are very few. And most of the time, his worries will go unspoken too. He's there, a firm foundation through all the storms of life, a sturdy hand to hold in times of stress and strife. A true friend we can turn to when times are good or bad. One of our greatest blessings, the man that we call dad. I share that this morning, um, and I know that Father's Day for some is a joyous day, and for others it may be a day that we feel, uh, well, feel the pains of life. And I want to remind us that the Father that is the ultimate Father, our Heavenly Father, is uh, the Father to the fatherless, to those who've had an earthly father who has, uh, for one reason or another, failed them. We can always turn to God. And I know that um, this morning as we celebrate Father's Day, I really like what it said in that video. I don't know if you caught it. it. said that we honor today the man who raised us. It may not be the biological father, but it may be. And, you, and we've all probably heard at some point stories of, of people or men who raised children and then only to discover they were not their biological children, but it didn't matter. They still were the dad. And so... Um, that's who we honor today, and um, we don't mean to cause pain for anyone uh, who's had a negative experience with a human, be human being, a man, uh, in that role. Uh, we do have a small gift for the, for the dads that are here, and uh, we'll share that with you uh, a little bit later, let you come pick one up. And, uh, but let's, uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you for today, this Lord's Day, June 21st, 2020. We thank you, Lord, for the fathers. As the poem said, the men that we call dad. Maybe, Lord, it was someone biological, and maybe not. But we thank you for those dads in our lives those who shepherded us, provided for us, protected us, encouraged us, who walked, Lord, with you and demonstrated what truly a man does. We thank you for them today. But we also thank you for the men in our fellowship. We pray, God, that you would continue to encourage them as they lead, continue to strengthen them as they are the sturdy rock that we are dependent upon. And then, Lord, I pray. I pray for the young boys, not only the teenagers and the adolescents, Lord, but I pray for the toddlers. I pray that the example of a godly man that they see will be encouragement to them of how to walk their lives, walk in their lives with you. Father, our nation is hurting. Strife and division are all around us. But you are a God and Father to this nation. And so, God, we ask today, again turning to that familiar verse, 
in 2 Chronicles 7.14, where you said that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my faith and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Father, again, our land needs healing. Lord, we need, on this Father's Day, we need men who know you and who are walking with you to stand up, to stand up and lead. And Lord, we know that it will not be popular, will not be resounding, but Lord, we pray for a clarion call to the hearts of men who know you and walk with you, to stand with courage now, to lead our communities, to lead our neighborhoods, to lead literally, Lord, our families back to you. So God, we pray you'd give us your grace, give us your mercy, and I pray, God, again, that you would bless the fathers that are part of this fellowship. Pray that you would bless me, God, now as I Endeavor to pro proclaim your word. I pray, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. For I stand in obedience to the call that you have placed upon my life, and I ask you to use me as your instrument. Think with my mind and speak with my voice, and allow me, O Lord, to decrease and you increase. And Father, I'll be ever careful to give you the praise and the glory. For it's in the mighty and precious name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. If you would turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. There is a lesson that we can learn about home leadership. Here in our text, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And it reads thusly in the New International Version it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exacerbate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. We know that right now our nation and our society is going through trauma. We see it every day. And a lot of what we are seeing is the consequence of, or the consequences of fatherlessness. Data supports that children from fatherless homes are affected in at least six major areas. The first being poverty, the second being drug abuse and al drug and alcohol abuse, the third is physical and emotional health, fourth is educational achievement, fifth is crime, and sixth is sexual activity and teen pregnancy. Children from fatherless homes are more likely to be poor, to become involved in drugs and alcohol abuse, to drop out of school, to suffer health, physical and mental health issues. Boys are more likely to become involved in criminal activity. 
girls are more likely to become pregnant at an early age. Paul, writing to the church at Ephesus, was, well, he was admonishing the congregation in this area of home leadership. Because back in, in, in those days, the, the, the gathering included children. They didn't have this thing called children's church or nursery. The children were in the worship. And so they were hearing Paul's letter read to the congregation. And so we hear this letter, and we know that the, that if, that the book of Ephesians, the theme of Ephesians is really a, a obedience and submission. And so Paul is addressing these issues. First, he addresses the issue to the children. He tells the children four things. He, th he reminds them that they are Christians. And that as Christians, they need to live righteously. They need to live right. And he's encouraging them that, that, that they need to live this way from the very beginning after they've made that profession of faith. And l let me just for a moment, I, I forgot to mention something that just reminded me that the interesting thing about in those times, children and wives were the possession of the father. They were the possession of the father. In fact, when a child was born, a child would be laid at the father's feet. And the father would look down at the child there between his feet. And if he picked up the child, the child would go home with them and, and be raised as a you know, part of the family. But if the father looked at them, looked at that child between his feet, and then walked away, that child could potentially be left there to die of exposure. So if that child was weak or a child was, it had some deformity in a way, the father could walk away and there would be nothing said about that. It was okay. And so when Paul writing to the church at Ephesus, we have to kind of understand the, the context when he says right off the bat, he says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. They're to live in a way that, that, it's, that glorifies God because it is the right thing to do. And obedience, we know, is right. This week I was looking through some things things that we had found at the house and you know I think everybody through through this experience of of COVID and being home is is cleaning out stuff and discovering things and so I discovered my autobiography that I wrote when I was in the eighth grade and I I I I laugh because it said the golden, the name of the, the, the way I named my autobiography was the, the golden years of a slave. And I'm thinking, wow, when I look at it now and I laugh, I'm thinking, I had no clue what golden meant. Because I'm in the eighth grade. This is like 1972. I'm writing this. And one of the things that I wrote when I, and I've got to get my glasses because it's really small print. This is what I wrote. This is the, the, the opening. And I want to just, just share this with you because I, I think it's important to, to for contextually how I understand. Says, I love to play out front on the lawn or in the backyard on the dirt with the ugly rocks, as my mom would say. And sometimes with my big brother after he came home from school. My brother was the big hero back then. He always looked out for me, even when I first came home from the hospital. He taught me how to draw my toy guns and later taught me how to draw beer from my dad's tap. My brother was and is five years older than me. 
He always went to school and left me home with my mom and by now my two-year-old puppy. Yes, sir, I was a big boy then. I was about three or four and I wasn't wearing diapers. My dad and my brother were my two biggest and nicest buddies. My dad used to let me wear his chief's hat, which was about 10 or 12 sizes too big. My brother would just help me tackle dad at night after he changed. My dad was at sea a lot, but he always wrote me letters, even though I couldn't read. He also sent me money every time he wrote. He wrote things, or he brought things home for me from all the countries he went to. Well, that's all for those days. Next, I'll talk about my kindergarten years. Bye for now. That's page two. I say that, and, and the reason I, I want to share that is, is that, again, thinking of children and obedience is right. My father, when he would write those letters from C, and my mom would read them, I, I don't have any, but I don't have any now, but I, and I can't prove it, but occasionally my mom would read those, and uh, she would say that Roland needed to behave himself, and he needed to stop doing this and stop doing that. And whether mom made that up or that was actually in the letter, when she sat me down to tell me or read the letter, she would say that. And so I would know that I'd better behave because dad had put it in his letter, even though he was gone to sea a lot. So obedience is right for children as they grow up. Obedience is commanded in the second verse. There. It says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. There's a promise there that, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on earth. And it doesn't say that your life will be perfect and all situations will be perfect. But if you honor your father and mother, there is a promise from God that your life, your life will be long. And, and we, don't, we know that some people die young and it's not because they dishonored their parents. It's maybe that they, the, the things that they were doing in their life put them at risk. But God wants us, again, to honor our fathers and mothers. And notice he's talking to the children and telling them, he's not saying question whether your father and mother are honorable. He's telling them that they ought to honor their father and mother so that their life will go well. And lastly, he tells them in this that it will bring, uh, obedience will bring a blessing in their lives. So Paul addresses the children. And then he gets to, well, I, will, I won't want to say, I don't want to say the, the meat of this lesson, but he gets to really a, a hard point when he gets to verse 4. And I don't mean to beat up on dads today. This is, after all, the day we celebrate dads. But he says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Some translation says provoke. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So he tells the fathers four things, really five things. He tells them not to provoke the children. We must not, and that's the interesting thing, there's, there's, out of all of the things, he starts with a thing that we are not to do. We're not to provoke our children. Oftentimes we can provoke our children just by teasing them. We think it's funny. And it may be funny that first time or second time or maybe even the third time, but then every time after that, without us knowing, it may inflict pain. And it may become a negative. 
And we're instructed to, to, to know our children well enough to know when we are inflicting that pain, when we are provoking them. And I would venture to say that we are not to compete with our children. That's childish behavior. And we're supposed to be the adults. We're supposed to be the ones of wisdom and knowledge. Just reading Proverbs. Secondly, he tells them that they are to nurture. Again, think about this for a moment. In their society, the father makes a decision whether this child is going to be a part of the family when he looks at him between him or her between his feet and makes a decision to either pick them up or not. And, and, and we often in our society, we leave the nurturing to child, of children to the mothers. That's not what we're supposed to do. Paul clearly says, fathers, that's what we're supposed to do. He clearly instructs us that we must nurture when we're talking about taking care of them. To bring them up in the training. We're part of that training. We are supposed to be the spiritual leaders in our homes. We're not supposed to just slough it off and say, well, I'm going to go out and be the provider. Great, you're the provider, you're the protector, but you also need to be the counselor and the leader. Again, I don't mean today to, to beat up on fathers. But we need to lead our homes. And I firmly believe that what we are seeing and experiencing in our nation today is a lack of home leadership. One of the stories that's been lost in all of the, 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 the negatives about La Mesa, I think, and that, that one of the stories that's been lost is a story of the young man who brought the items back that he had taken out of the store when they were looting in the store. Because when he got home, he looked down at all of the things that he had and he knew that they were not his and he had not purchased them. And he took them back. I would say, you know, or I guess society would say, he manned up. And he walked in there and he looked the man who owned the shop in the face and gave him back his items. The police were around and he yet did that. Somehow I would believe that, I believe that this young man had some nurturing in his life to do the right thing. The second thing that a father must do is he must discipline. And some dads are known to be the disciplinarian in the house. And that's a difficult task. It's a difficult position because we have to be the disciplinarian, but we need to know how to discipline. Not to do harm and create abuse, but to discipline them in love. Then the the fourth or the third thing they're supposed to do, fathers are supposed to do, supposed to instruct. I remember, I remember sitting down and we found a, again, cleaning up, found a picture of me sitting on the couch with Jay reading a book. I was reading to him. And I will never forget when he figured out, a little, when he got a little bit older and Ryan was, was born and he figured out and, and was astonished that I could read. Dad can read, he, he told Ryan. He goes, Ryan, Ryan, Dad can read. And that didn't say, I mean, it was, it's funny, but it's also sad. It's sad that it came to that point where, it, and it really just shows that instruction that Adrian had been reading to them for so long that that had become just second nature. They didn't even think of me as being the person that would sit down and read with them. And when I did it, it taught them something. 
not only could dad read, but it also taught them that dad could be caring. Dad could take that time. The fourth thing that Paul told the fathers is that they need to encourage. We train them up in the instruction of the Lord. They are the example. They are to be the example that the children see. It's one thing to honor God and to think of God as our heavenly father, but he's not there for us to see. The example he has is earthly men. And we're to be the ones who encourage them. So we take all this into account. Well, there's one thing that, that I haven't mentioned, and it's intentional because I want to get to this at the end. These instructions for not only the children and the fathers is based on the relationship that the children and more importantly that the fathers have with Jesus Christ. For it's out of the relationship we have with Christ that we learn nurture. We learn discipline. We are encouraged and we learn and are instructed about Father God. It's through that relationship. And if we can win the Father's heart to the Lord, the wife will follow and the children will follow right behind. For so long in the church, what we have experienced is that women have been in leadership. And I'm not... Don't hear me say I, I'm not against women in leadership in the church. Don't hear me say that. But it's in the 80-20 principle, and that 80% of the work is being done by 20% of the people, and that 20% of the people are the women. You go back even and look in our denomination. And again, I'm not criticizing our denomination, but the... The, the ones who were in charge of starting the Brotherhood Ministry was the Women's Missionary Union. The WMU started the Brotherhood and then turned it over, got it all organized and up and running, and then gave it to the men. We learn from our mothers. That's why probably the most other than Christmas and Resurrection Sunday, the, the highest attendance day, number three, in the church is Mother's Day. Because no, no living human being in their right mind has a mother in the church. And she says, all I want you to do is go to church with me on Sunday because it's Mother's Day. No one's going to say, no, Mom, I'm not going. They'll come. They'll come and hear the gospel because of the relationship they have with the mom. We need to change that. And I know it's been there a long time, but we need to change that so that it's a relationship with the father and the mother because they're walking with the Lord in discipline and instruction and encouraging the children to have a right relationship with the Lord. That's what Paul was trying to tell the church at Ephesus in the midst of this crazy society that gave value as possessions of wives and children. The leaders, the fathers, he's instructing them. He's not telling them they're better or, or, or worse, but he's trying to tell them, trying to get to their heart. Trying to get them to, if you will, step up to the plate and lead. And right now, in our country, and in our city, and in our community, and in our neighborhoods, and literally in our homes, we need men to step up and lead. Not lead by domination. Not lead by possessing. But lead by nurturing. Lead by showing that they're discipline lead by instruction one last thing that I one last point I'll make 
my dad, as I said, I, as I read for you in the, the brief intro of my biography, or autobiography, talked about my dad was out to sea a lot. Well, now that I'm an adult and father and grandfather, I'm able to still do some, I'm able to do some things around the house. And I've been asked by my family, how did you learn to do that? And what I say and have said time and time again is I watched my dad. I watched my dad. Brothers and sisters, our children are watching. They're watching, and dare I say, they're waiting for us to step into leadership. But we'll never be the leaders that we need to be outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ. We'll never be able to emulate Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, without a relationship. We have to surrender our pride and our egos, push them aside and, and say consciously and sincerely, Lord, I need you in my life to be father, to be husband, to be leader, to be the man that you want me to be. We need to admit that. We need to believe that Jesus came, that he died, and he rose again. And we need to just say, yes, that's true. All, the, all of history and all of the evidence proves that he has risen. There is no grave that is holding his remains. He has resurrected. And when we, we make that profession of faith, we believe that and profess that, and he comes into our lives, the, he meaning the Holy Spirit, to guide us, to instruct us, to discipline us, so that we'll be more and more like the Father. So today, I want to encourage men. We need to step up. Home leadership begins with a relationship with Jesus Christ. Will you accept him today? Invite him into your life. He'll save you and be your Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, so very much for today, so very much for what we what we read and what we understand from your word. It is hard, Father, for us to fathom in this day and age that children were just merely a possession, a means, if you will, to an end, maybe even to help economically with a family. Lord, I pray that these words that we've read in Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about home leadership, that we would step up, Lord, and I, that we'd step up, Lord, and, and just hear the encouragement that Paul was offering to the church. And Lord, we're not forgetting the women. We're not forgetting the mothers. Lord, we thank you for them. Thank you for their, their stepping into the void that's crea been created. Lord, you have put leadership in the home in order. May we step into that order, God. Not for our sake, but to glorify you and to lift up your name. So the children of today, the fatherless, even those, Lord, who don't have mothers, that they would see men and women who know you, who are walking with you, 
and that they would come into their lives to become those fathers and mothers that those children need. God, we pray. We pray, Lord, that you'd bless us to respond to your word in a way that brings glory to your name. For it's in your name, Jesus, that I pray with joy, thanksgiving, and forgiveness of sin. Amen.